the outer planets tended to move around quite a bit. They migrated. Now, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune sent planetesimals in toward the Sun. That means they had to generally move outwards. Whereas Jupiter flung planetesimals out to very great distances, even ejected them from the solar system, and that means that Jupiter had to move in. What determines these in and out movements? They result from a law of physics that says energy is never lost. When a planet ejects a planetesimal, the planet itself has to move in a little bit, and that's simple conservation of energy. It's giving a lot of energy to the planetesimal, dumping it way out there. That means it, the planet, has to move in. It loses energy. If an orbiting object loses energy, it's not moving as quickly. That means it drops to a lower orbit. The amusement park, again, illustrates the forces at work. In this case, the slingshot effect. It's a gravitational boost that large planets can give small objects. In the 1970s, scientists exploited it to accelerate the Voyager spacecraft as it swung from planet to planet in the outer solar system. Here on Earth, we can think of the slingshot as a roller coaster over the edge. The boomerang roller coaster ride that we have here is a nice example of the processes that are involved in the slingshot effect. The gravity here that makes this work here on Earth is using Earth's gravity. It pulls down on the cart, and it pulls it down the slope, and then the cart goes back up the slope due to the momentum it gained from coming down the slope. What if we were to add Jupiter to the system? Now Jupiter's gravity will still pull the object in, but Jupiter swings it around the planet, and it goes around Jupiter, and the motion of Jupiter gives it an extra kick, so that it gets more momentum than it came in with, and gets shooting back up the slope and out into space. Millions of small gravitational tugs have made subtle changes to the planetary orbits for more than half a billion years. Earth and the other young planets may settle into conditions conducive to early life. If so, it's about to be wiped out as the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn reach a remarkable tipping point called a resonance. As soon as Jupiter and Saturn hit the resonance, it was catastrophic. The entire solar system flew apart in just a million years, which is a tiny amount of time compared to the age of the solar system. The resonance means that every time Saturn orbits the Sun once, Jupiter will go around twice. The result? Jupiter and Saturn come very close to each other in the same part of the solar system on a regular, ongoing basis, creating an immense gravity pump. It's like pumping a kid on a swing. If you hit the kid on the swing at just the right time, you can get the motion to go higher and higher and higher. The most dramatic effect is on the two outermost giant planets. As all of the planets were orbiting around the solar system, having gravitational interactions with each other, one of the most amazing things that happened is that Uranus and Neptune actually switched places. So now Neptune is farther away than Uranus. The resonance is a cataclysm whose effects sweep through the system at astounding speed, not only shifting orbits, but clearing out most of the system's small objects. Jupiter alone is quite a gravitational bully and gradually depleted the asteroid belt. But the Jupiter-Saturn resonance caused a catastrophic depletion of both the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt. 99% of the bodies in the asteroid and Kuiper belts are cleared. While most of them are thrown out of the system, some of them plunge inward. Drawn by the gravity of the sun, they rip through space toward the inner solar system. How will the inner planets, including the Earth, escape the onslaught? The making of our solar system reaches a violent climax 700 million years after the pre-solar cloud first began to collapse. And Earth is in the firing line.
gravitational chaos of Jupiter and Saturn is battering the inner solar system's planets and moons in an event now known as the Late Heavy Bombardment. A lot of the material in the outer solar system, these comets, fell in towards the inner solar system where they collided with the inner planets and the moon, creating the craters that we see today. Some researchers believe collisions may have repeatedly sterilized the Earth and that if life had formed, it was wiped out and had to start anew. But the impact of objects from space, along with their violence, may have also brought a benefit. The Earth might not have all the water it does today had it not been bombarded by material from the outer solar system. Some have speculated that much of the water we have on Earth is actually a result of impacts from the late heavy bombardment period. Today, 4.6 billion years after the solar system's birth, the ongoing, if remote, danger of a massive asteroid strike means the story is not over. More important, though, are the hundreds of tiny asteroids hitting the planet as meteorites. Studying them tells us if the making of the solar system really happened when and how we think it did. I'm holding a sample of the Allende meteorite. The Allende meteorite is a fragment of rock that fell in Mexico near the village of Allende in 1969. One of the components of the meteorite are these calcium aluminum rich inclusions, these white objects that you can see on the surface. These are the oldest known materials in the solar system. And we know this by age dating with radiogenic isotopes. In his high-tech lab at UCLA, cosmochemist Ed Young and his colleagues carefully examine tiny samples of ancient meteorites. There's a big white fragment in the middle, which we want to cut out. The lab's precision lasers aim at the fragments, blasting out holes no wider than a human hair. Sophisticated analysis measures radioactive elements, which serve as atomic clocks. In early 2011, cosmochemists in a similar lab at Arizona State University dated part of a North African meteorite to an incredibly accurate 4.5682 billion years old the oldest material ever found on Earth, older than the planet itself. In August 2011, the Dawn spacecraft arrived in the asteroid belt, source of most meteorites. Close-up pictures of Vesta, the second largest asteroid, open a new epoch in telling the solar system's story. One of the exciting things about the Dawn mission is that we're going to get our first glimpse into something that was essentially a mini planet that was formed right at the beginning of the solar system. Since its birth early in the solar system's history, Vesta has been undisturbed by weather or many of the geologic forces that have changed the planets over time. Just like some of the larger planets, it has volcanoes, it has a core, but unlike these larger planets, not much else has happened to it in the past four and a half billion years. So we essentially get a window back into that very earliest history of the solar system. Dawn will orbit Vesta for a year before going on to spend another year orbiting the largest asteroid, Ceres. Meanwhile, NASA's Juno probe has just begun its voyage to Jupiter, where it will visit the giant planet to determine if it really does have a solid core and formed early and quickly, as scientists now believe. Even more crucial are other stars with their own solar systems whose formation sheds essential light on our own. The most important reason for understanding how the solar system was made was to find out whether or not we're normal. When you look out and look at other solar systems being made with our telescopes today, for example, in Orion and other places, we, we want to answer the question, how normal is the solar system? Launched in 2009, the Kepler mission is now running full blast. 
and has identified 1,200 possible planets around other stars. Some systems have Jupiter-sized planets close to their suns or in lopsided orbits. Others have only small planets crowded closely in the hot zone of their stars. Our solar system, however, has its planets in near circular orbits, spread out in a stable arrangement that seems almost too perfect. One of the great surprises of the last decade as we started to discover other planetary systems was the fact that our solar system seems to be one of the oddballs. Most because our own solar system is so regular. Is the solar system made by processes that we can observe going on today? Or are we somehow special? This goes to the point of whether or not life is special. And that question is perhaps the most important one of all, as the life story of the sun and its planets essentially becomes the life story of life itself, humanity on Earth, and our ultimate place, alone or among many, in the universe.